Okay, so as Town mentioned, we're going to talk about um, measuring <laughs> environmental variability across study regions. So uh, we'll just start off um, talking about biomes a little bit. At a very broad scale, people generally um, classify different environmental variation into different biomes, which are driven mainly by temperature and rainfall, and it's determined by the major, the predominant vegetation in an area. So if we're looking at Africa, we can see that there's desert and savanna and rainforest, but if you're going to be doing a regional analysis, these categories are far too broad to capture any variation across your area. If you zoom in a little bit, kind of the next level are ecosystems, and this is just an example of different ecosystems across Africa, according to the World Wildlife Fund. Um, so you could see, you know, if you're zooming into kind of this desert region, then there's actually quite a few different ecosystems going on in this area. And if you zoom in further to Uganda, as Town was mentioning, then there's quite a bit of environmental variation going on in just this small area. So there's rainforest, montane areas, savanna, um, you know, just a wide variety of different environments available in this area. So what we're going to talk about <coughs> today is just different ways to measure these environmental variables and examples of data that um, has been measured across different um, regions, and then how to observe the environmental data in your region, and then um, how to compare this with your occurrence points and the environmental data across the entire study area. <coughs> so, um, there's a lot of different ways to, or to measure environmental variables, but Recently, over the past 30 or 40 years, a lot of people have been utilizing remote sensing data, which is captured from satellites that fly over the Earth, and they collect data that's reflected from the Earth's surface, and then they um, collect these different numbers and calibrate them into these different data products, like elevation or um, measurements of primary productivity or um, greenness of vegetation in an area. And so there's a, you can also measure environmental variables by interpolating your data across an area. And this involves having, a, for example, a lot of weather stations in a region and then estimating values between these different weather stations. And the results of these different data capturing methods are always um, turned into this continuous gridded surface, which is called a raster grid. And so you can kind of think about it a little bit the way that we've been talking about quadrats and the grids that you've been looking at to see whether or not you have well-known sample sites or not well-known sample sites. This is just a continuous grid that has um, different values for temperature or precipitation across your region. So this is an example of an interpolated surface for temperature across Uganda. And you can see up here, um, there's higher temperatures in this region. And then where there's blue areas, there's lower regions. This is the Lake Victoria area here. Um, so these are occurrence points that we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute but you can see where your occurrence points lie across a gridded surface and get an idea of which environments your sample points are representing across your entire study region. This is another example um, of precipitation. It's also an interpolated surface. This is a product that measures the green up of different vegetation in an area. So this can be really useful if you're looking at a species that where perhaps secondary forest is really important to your species, then there's a certain range of values for these um, that represent secondary forest. So you can identify the variation across your study region and whether or not you're really capturing all of that secondary forest or if there's other uh, more scrub-like um, vegetation in the region. 
if you're looking at fisheries or whales, as Arturo was talking about, then you can look at different um, sea variables, sea surface temperature is an example. So the black part here is the land surface, and then these different values represent the temperature in the ocean. And then, of course, elevation is an important variable that a lot of people look at. And you can also derive a lot of different variables from just using an elevation service. So one of these is the compound topographic index. And this, um, this environmental variable measures where water is likely to collect in if there's a precipitation event. So these areas show if it were to rain, Here's where water would be collecting in the blue areas, and then in the red areas, this is where um, it's likely to run off. So if you have a species that, especially for botanists, if you have a species that really prefers to be in moist soil or, um, or maybe they prefer to be in very dry soil, this um, data layer can tell you a lot about what's going on in your study region and whether or not you have sampled all of the moist areas or the dry areas or where it's potentially to be dry in your area. So, <coughs> of course, all of these different data products come in a variety of different scales and resolutions. So, generally, the climate data tends to be very coarse. So, often when you're looking at the climate data uh, from a remote sensing product where the satellite went over and is collecting data, then it's going to be very coarse, so it will be hard to, um, to get an idea of the variation across your area. If you're looking at interpolated surfaces, then a lot of times you can get a lot more information from those data layers. So really, you know, these go from one degree resolution all the way down to a one meter resolution. So you have to think about your species, what might be important to your species, and what kind of variation, you know, what is the scale of variation that you might want to look at for your species to be able to identify if you've captured the variation that you're interested in across your study region. So, in order to observe this environmental variation, um, basically you have your occurrence points that are located at different um, X and Y coordinates. And um, so these would be, this is the example, um, just envision this as this gridded surface across where this red square is. And each of these um, squares has a value. And so if these are the occurrence points for your species, then you can take the value at that location and then put it over into a table over here. And this is going to represent all of the environmental values where your species is located. And the next step then, if you want to get a little bit better idea of what's going on across your study region, is that you can, even though Town just talked about not putting random points across your study region, if you want to just visualize what might be going on in your study region, then you can put a whole bunch of random points across that same area. And so <coughs> you would do the same thing. If these are the random points, then you extract these <coughs> environmental values at those random points, and then you put them into the table over here, and then you'll be able to visualize what's going on between your occurrence points, the environmental values at your occurrence points, and the environmental values at the random locations. And that's what we're going to be looking at a little bit today. We're gonna use the example of the shoebill stork, which is, I guess, in, is it endemic to this region or whatever? Okay. <laughs> okay, the shoebill stork has this, um, this is the range of the shoebill stork according to the IUCN um, polygon. And basically this bird likes freshwater swamps. And so we're gonna take a look at how you can use remote sensing data to then um, observe these environmental variables across the region and then all the way down to what might be important for these, um, for these storks in this area and what's going on across our entire study region. We're just gonna use two variables to make it pretty simple. So we're gonna look at temperature and precipitation 
And again, this is the interpolated surface that I was talking about before. These are the occurrence points that I pulled down from GBIF, and um, these are their locations. So you can see that they're kind of distributed close to Lake Victoria, and then also there's another kind of cluster of points up here. But if you're looking at this surface, <coughs> then you can kind of see right away that there are certain areas that haven't been sampled very well by these um, occurrence points. So, um, for example, there's not a lot of points in these really dark blue areas, which are low temperature areas, or in these really um, red areas, which are very high temperatures. So, <coughs> these are areas that if you were just looking at the environmental values at your sample points, it's not really representative of the environment across your entire study region. And then we're also going to do the same thing for precipitation. And here you can see that there's a little bit higher precipitation in this area, and the points don't really, there's no environmental values that would be um, associated with any of the occurrence points that are at this higher precipitation <coughs> region. And then the other thing that you have to think about is when you're looking at these environmental variables that you're interested in for your species, it's not just one variable or the other variable. You have to also think about the combinations of the variables. <coughs> so here I've overlaid the temperature surface <coughs> onto the precipitation surface. And there's a little bit different colors. So it may be that these um, occurrence points do a really good job of representing temperature in a certain area, but they may not do as good of a job representing precipitation in the area. So when you're looking at the combination of the two variables, there may be these environments that are not, um, that are not, that the, sorry, the combinations of the two are not representative of the combinations across the entire study region. So it's not just this one <coughs> independent variable versus another independent variable. The more variables that you're interested in, you're going to have to kind of think about, you know, where is it really warm and rainy, or where is it really cold and rainy, and is this represented across my um, occurrence points? So now to make it a little bit so that everybody will be able to see a little bit better, we're going to go ahead and do this in QGIS and show how to have your occurrence points, extract the environmental values from your occurrence points, and then also how to extract environmental values from a bunch of random points across your study area. And then we're going to take a look at, um, at visualizing to see whether or not the sampled areas from your occurrence points are really representative of the environments across your study region. So Town's going to kind of, we're gonna do this on his laptop computer and yeah. We're gonna interrupt.